Okay. Um, your first quiz is next week. Uh, it's going to be at the beginning of lecture, um, so make sure you are on time or a little bit early, because um, we'll try to start right at 9. The, lec the quiz will be all on fluids, so last lecture and then the first part of this lecture and I think roughly the first two DLs, but I'll post that specifically. Um, I posted practice quizzes online. Um, there's a lot of them. Don't feel like you need to do all of them, but there are two that I wrote in past quarters, so if you want to see my problem writing style and uh, rudimentary design skills, you can take a look at my practice quizzes, and then there are some other ones that I think are a bit harder um, to take a look at. Some of them are a little bit confusing, um, but yeah, give them a shot, and I, re I recommend trying at least one or two in like a realistic quiz environment, just meaning like give yourself 20 minutes, don't look anything up, don't look at notes, um, and see what you can do. Um, and ideally, once you've done a bit of studying, just to get a feel for uh, things that you might be missing and just to kind of practice the pressure, because it's not a lot of time. Um, anything else? Office hours are all posted now, so those have started. Um, you can go to any of them for this AB sections or the CD sections, mine are on Mondays. Um, before the quizzes from 12 to 1 in the physics building. Uh, the quizzes won't be curved individually. Um, I just curve at the end of the quarter by like changing the grade cutoffs. Um, but to give you a feel for how you're doing, I'll post the averages and the standard deviations for each one so you can kind of get a feel for uh, your grade in the class as we go. Um, any other logistics questions or things? The average will come out to around a B minus. It depends on like specifics, like what the exact number is, but I aim for about an 80. Um, and I, yeah, I try to make the cutoffs as generous as possible. Like there's a given grade distribution that I have to follow. And so I will try to follow that as liberal, like as in your favor as I can. Um, and yeah, it all just boils, unfortunately it does just boil down to how you do in relation to your peers. I don't think that's a helpful way to try to think about how to approach the course, but uh, yeah, like last quarter grades were pretty low and the curve was huge. I intend to not do that as much. Like ideally there would be no curve and you know, you, if you get a B minus, that means you got 80% of the things right, but uh, it's pretty hard to, to write assessments that work out just like that. Um, the other thing is with curves, I'll never curve anyone down. So whatever the curve is, uh, it will only increase your grade if it, if it changes it. Okay, um, so this is where we left off last time with our complete Bernoulli's equation, and we built this up. We looked at how to figure out what each one of these terms are. The left-hand side, uh, we need to pick a start and an end point. Right? And so each term is a delta, and we only care about the value for each of these terms at our start point and at our end point, or really the difference, the final minus initial. The right-hand side, the pump and the resistance or thermal dissipation occurs anywhere in between the final and initial points that we picked. Uh, if the pump is just before our initial or the resistance is just after our final, whatever, then it doesn't count. All of this has to occur either at our endpoints for the right or in between our endpoints, uh, sorry, at our endpoints for the left or in between our endpoints for the right hand side. The thing that it's actually tracking, like the units for all five of these terms, are energy density, right? Joules per, per volume of fluid. Um, and it's carried throughout the circuit by a current a, that's tracked as a flow rate or a volume per time. Um, so we're tracking fluid that has some associated energy density as it flows through a circuit and comparing at two different points. Yeah? We're about to do one, but in you kind of just as a, so if I pick two points, it might, the, the choice depends on the problem. Like if there's a certain piece of the circuit that the problem asks about, I probably want that part to be included in my, uh, yeah, in my Bernoulli equation. But once I pick my start point and I pick my end point, that means for like something like delta PE, I evaluate it based on the height at my final and the height at my initial. So like 
rho gh final minus rho gh initial. That's what all those terms are. And then for E pump minus volume, say, I mean, this is just me waving my hands in the air, but this is my initial point and this is my final. The pumps that I have to take into account are the ones that are in between the start and the end point. If they're not in between them, on, their, on, their, on either side, then I don't include them. So let's do an example. Maybe this will help, um, even though there's no resistance or pumps quite yet. So let's look at just drinking through a straw. It's a very simple example. We all know exactly what happens, but we've probably never looked at it in painstaking detail before. Uh, but that's what this class is for. So we have a cup of water. This is the fluid system that we looked at a lot last lecture. And we know that at the surface, we have PATM, right? The air around us is that PATM, just atmospheric pressure. And since the air is in contact with the surface of this fluid, and there's no movement of that contact point, they're pushing against each other equally as hard. And so they're at the same pressure. So the surface of the fluid is at PATM. So let's put a straw in the cup. And it doesn't really change anything, right? Before we start sucking on the straw, the straw is just sitting there. There's air in the straw above the surface of the water. That's still at PATM. And the pressure at the end of the straw is also PATM, right? Even though they're technically at different heights, the surface of the fluid and the end of the straw, since the density, rho, of air is so small, changes in height on the scale of inches or even feet or tens of feet uh, really make no difference, no noticeable difference in pressure. Right? You have to make huge changes uh, in height in order to experience a change in significant change in potential energy density or pressure for air. So we approximate it as the same. OK, so now the interesting part. We put our mouth on a straw, start sucking, and fluid goes, flows up through it. Right? So now we have some flow to analyze something interesting. And to do that, we need to first decide what our delta is between. Right? There's a system here, and if I want to write and solve Bernoulli's equation, I need my final and initial point. So a few points I can identify. There's the surface of the water. There's, I didn't label it, but maybe the bottom of the straw at the bottom of the cup. There's the height in the straw that's equal to the level of the water outside. That maybe is another interesting point. The end of the straw where it meets the mouth. All of these different ones. So sometimes it can be a little tricky deciding where my start and end points are, especially here where we just don't really have a question to answer. We're just kind of vaguely figuring out what's going on here. So I'm going to suggest let's use one of our starting points as PATM at the surface of the water that's in contact with the air because we know the pressure there. So that's a good reason to pick it because we know something about it. And then the other end, let's just pick the end of the straw where it meets our mouth because that's, I don't know, the end of the system that we're looking at. So that encapsulates the whole system. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The flow to get from the surface of the cup to our mouth goes down through the cup. So if we suck water through it, the fluid will flow down through the cup and then up through the straw through our mouth. And so it's kind of interesting because the flow, we've never seen like a case where a pipe is submerged in another pipe. So it kind of looks strange, but we should be able to deal with it. Right, the first pipe is the cup, or the cross-sectional area of the cup, minus this little piece where the straw is sticking through it. And then that fluid flows in to the straw, which is the second pipe you can think of that has a clearly much smaller cross-sectional area. So if we wanted to think of it differently, you like flip the straw down going through the bottom, and you would just see a wide pipe funneling in to a narrow pipe. So that's how we're going to turn this into a fluid system that we can recognize. Um, again, our start point is the surface, and our end point is once it flows down and up through the straw to our mouth. And then the final thing to note is that we need to make kind of an approximation to say that this is actually a steady state fluid system, that the behavior isn't changing over time. Why? Well, what happens when you suck water through a straw? What happens to the water in the cup? goes away, right? The, the water level is going to drop. And that's going to change the behavior of our system, like potential energy density going from the surface to the bottom. Like, it, it will clearly be different. And eventually, it's going to run out. So this isn't truly a steady state system. But we can make two approxim one of two approximations in order to take care of that. One, we can just say, this cup's like the size of an ocean, so, or maybe even just like a, a big drum. And so if we sip from a straw, the amount of water lost is not going to be significant enough for us to observe a change in the water level over any normal amount of time. 
that we would be drinking from. So we can either approximate so much water that it barely affects the volume, or we could say that we're just looking at this on a very, very small time scale. So if we're just zooming in to like a tenth of a second of this behavior, then it's approximately the same over that amount of time compared to the rate at which we're drinking. So you'll never have to make an approximation like that on your own, but since we're doing this together and kind of doing a vague kind of guided problem, um, it'll work for now. So now let's finally use our Bernoulli equation. We have our starting point at the surface, ending point at the mouth. Pressure change, well, we don't know what that is yet. We know one end, PATM, um, at the surface, but uh, how about potential energy density? Well, for poten oh, sorry, cross, we can cross these out, right? Is there a pump anywhere between the surface of the water and where the straw meets our mouth? No. So this is what I was saying. We, there might be a pump somewhere else in the system we don't know, but it doesn't matter. Tracing water from the surface down up through the straw, there's no pumps. So cross it out. And then resistance, I'll just say, let's assume there's no resistance. Sorry, I missed that part. So now potential energy density. Our change in height, again, we only have to look at the value of height at our starting and our ending point. So it doesn't actually matter that the water goes down first and then up. It just matters the height difference between the surface of the water and our mouth. So final, final minus initial will just be H mouth minus H, H surface. H mouth is smaller than H surface, right? Or sorry, H mouth is higher than H surface, right? The water goes from lower down to higher up eventually. And so our delta PE over volume term is going to be positive, right? The water gains potential energy as it goes from start to final. Kinetic energy density. So we already kind of did the work for this. We know that as the water flows originally, it's in this big wide pipe, that is the cup, and then it flows into a narrower pipe by the time it reaches the end. And so the area goes down, so we know that the velocity must go up. To see that written out explicitly, our delta Ke term is 1 half rho delta V squared. So we have 1 half rho, and then this is V final squared minus V initial squared. And we solved for V in terms of the current and the cross-sectional area, right? Remember, flow rate or current is equal to A times V. So if we want to solve for V, it's just I over A. They both have the same current. So that's a very important part to notice here, that the current is conserved, because anything that flows out of the cup has to flow into the mouth, right? It's a one steady state fluid system. And so the only difference between these two terms is the area. Area of the straw is smaller than area of the cup, and since it's in the denominator, uh, that term will be larger, and so that's why it's positive. So that's a lot more thinking than just the area goes down, so speed goes up, and kinetic energy density goes up, but it's good to be able to work through that in case you were solving this quantitatively. Okay, so now we have delta P plus two positive terms equals zero. So, um, we know that pressure is going to decrease as we go from the surface of the water down through the system and to our mouth. So if we expanded delta P as P mouth minus P ATM and rearrange, we can find that P mouth is just P ATM minus these two positive values. So in other words, we had some pressure, atmospheric pressure, and we spent it on both increasing our height, increasing our potential energy density, and increasing our speed, increasing our kinetic energy density. So P mouth is lower than P ATM. So that's, I guess, kind of all we can figure out from this system, which kind of makes sense. You have lower pressure in your mouth, and so water flows from high pressure to low pressure. Pressure is decreasing as we flow through. So to explain it in English, I guess sucking reduces the pressure in your mouth. We know the pressure in your mouth is now lower than the pressure of the atmosphere, and so if you think about it still for a second, so just imagine all the water in the system is at rest. The surface that's exposed to the air is being pushed on with a force per unit area. Remember, pressure is also just force per unit area of PATM. That's how hard the atmosphere is pushing on the surface of the water. And then the air in our mouth is pushing on the surface of the water at the end of the straw with a force per unit area that is smaller than that, PATM minus whatever we figured out. And so if the air outside is pushing harder than the air in our mouth, the air outside is going to win, and water is going to flow down and up into the mouth, right? 
So that pressure differential causes the flow from high pressure to low pressure. Um, so if we want to extend this a little bit, what is happening? Like, what is our mouth doing? Well, I don't know the, I guess, physiological details of it, but the mouth essentially works like a pump. And how do I know that? Well, we don't want the water that goes into our body to be pressurized, right? You don't want your stomach to be like a vacuum or a balloon. You just want it to be at equilibrium with the air around us. So if it, the water entering your mouth is at a pressure lower than PATM, then it needs to get pushed back up. It needs to be given more energy density to get back to PATM in order for us to conserve, to have PATM, like atmospheric pressure inside our bodies. And so something's going on where there's a pump somewhere in your throat or in your mouth or whatever that's causing lower pressure in your mouth and that causes water to flow into it and then it pumps it back up to PATM so that we have this PATM to a lower pressure back to PATM is the journey that the water travels through as it flows from the cup into our mouth. Um, so yeah, this is, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be able to put all this together from scratch by yourself, um, but it's good to be able to use this model and apply it to some simple systems that we might see around us. Um, okay, questions on this example? Yeah. That's a good question. So we'll uh, expand on that a little bit, but it's, I would say it's both. So when we say R, like the R in these equations, so, uh, well, I'll just go to the next slide. We won't talk about the questions yet, but there's this top pipe has just some value R of resistance, and that is the total resistance for the whole pipe. I times it will give me a change in energy density. However, if we wanna really look at how resistance works physically, if, we, if I have a certain pipe with, made of a certain material and a certain fluid flowing through it, I can measure the amount of resistance, the amount of thermal energy den and density dissipation there will be. But then, if I make that pipe twice as long, intuitively, we kind of know that there's going to be more resistance, right? The, the fluid is going to meet the same amount of resistance going through the first half of the pipe, but then it has to keep going, and it's going to meet a lot more. So there is this resistance per unit length measure that's important. So I would say the resistance per unit length is the quality of the pipe, or like really the interaction between the fluid and the pipe. That just describes how much they stick together, how hard it is to get one through the other. And then that's not the whole story, because it is important to know how much of that material, how much of that resistance the fluid encounters. So when we plug into Bernoulli's equation, we just care about the total. But to get there, I might need to do a little more work. And we'll, we'll talk about that kind of uh, in a different light soon. Okay, so now this, I wanna rush through these clicker questions pretty quickly because this is the exact example that I did physically for you last time. And so we're just gonna kind of refresh. So rely on your memory, rely on your problem solving skills, whichever you're in the more, more in the mood for today. Um, but we have a pipe with air flowing through the top. There is resistance in this pipe. And then below it, we have these tubes of water that are connected that will show us what the relative pressures are. So first question, how does water level one compare to water level three? Remember, I'm not using these for attendance or looking at who answers what, whatever, it's just a way for you to practice and for me to see how we're doing partway through the lecture. Give you 10 more seconds. All right, I'll stop us there. So, uh, our Bernoulli equation between points one and three simplifies to just delta P equals minus IR. Why? Well, there's no change in height. There is a change in area in the middle. However, the area at one and the area at three are the same. And so there's no change in kinetic energy density between our two endpoints. And there's no pump in between them, but we know there's resistance. So we just get delta P equals minus IR. Since minus IR is negative, that tells us that delta P 
is also negative. So we get a decrease in pressure. And then the last little trick here is that these are kind of like inverted standpipes. Since the pressure at one is higher than the pressure at three, it's gonna push down harder on the fluid. And so H1 will actually be smaller than H3. Right, so that's the little trick here. If they were standpipes pushing fluid up, we would see the water level in one be higher, but uh, kind of different here. Okay, next one, how does the water level in one compare to the water level in two? Um, the pressure at one is higher than pressure at three. We got that. So since one, remember pressure can also be force per unit area. So the water level in one is going to be a result of how hard the air in one is pushing down on it. And so since the pressure at one is higher than the pressure at three, the force per unit area that one is pushing down on the water is higher than at three. So if it's pushing down harder, the fluid level is going to be lower like almost like a seesaw where one is heavier and it's going to win. Okay, so moving on to this question. A lot fewer responses for this one, um, but our Bernoulli equation gains a term. Now we do have a change in kinetic energy density. The area decreases, so the speed will increase. So now we have a negative IR term over here, a positive kinetic energy density term over here, so if we were to move the kinetic energy density term over to the right and solve for the change in pressure, we get them two negative terms. And so we find that our pressure change term has to also be negative. So now going from one to two, we're both spending energy density on thermal energy or dissipation from resistance, and we're spending it on speeding up the fluid. And so the pressure at two is going to be smaller than the pressure at one, which means that the height at two is going to be larger because the two is not pushing down on the water as hard as one is. Okay, last one. How does the water level two compare to water level three? Give you 15 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna stop us there. So, same Bernoulli equation that we had before. We do have a kinetic energy density term, except now we're going from narrow to wide. So since our area is, is increasing, our speed is decreasing. And so our kinetic energy density change term is negative. And so if we take this negative and move it over to the right, we get two terms, a negative minus IR, but then a positive. So we actually don't know what the sign of the change in pressure is. We can't tell. However, we, yeah. That's a good, yeah, that's a typo. Thanks for catching that, yeah. Cause over in the velocity term, I did it right, final minus initial, but here I did initial minus final. So good, good call. Um, yeah, so whenever you're doing these, it's best to do final minus initial, where final is, as our friend said, downstream, um, which just means in the direction of the current. So when you're moving in the direction of the current, final should be further along. Otherwise, you run into issues with the sign of your current. Um, thank you. Okay, so we can't tell. However, we did this in lecture and we found that there actually was, uh, H2 was higher than H3. The reason being is that uh, resistance was very small, at least much smaller than the change in energy density due to kinetic energy density. So if we assume that the minus IR term is small, then the kinetic energy density term dominates, so we get negative, positive, or sorry, yeah, negative and negative, and so the pressure change from two to three is positive, meaning that 
the water level of the three is a little bit lower since it has a higher pressure. Um, OK, so this should have been review, um, but questions about these? I like this because it kind of combines conceptual thinking and like quantitative reasoning with these plus and minus. On a quiz, you'll probably most often have to give numbers, but it is very helpful to check your work and know what's going on and be able to do this type of reasoning where you like write down Bernoulli's equation, get rid of what's not changing, and then just be able to like say, oh, this is positive, this is negative, so this must increase, whatever, um, and being able to, to check your work like that. Okay. Uh, so now let's start transitioning toward electrical circuits. Um, I'm actually going to introduce a concept that we're only going to use in practice for electrical circuits, but I'm going to introduce it with fluids, um, both to take advantage of something we're already comfortable with, but also to emphasize that the overarching concepts and like the mathematical structure is the exact same thing. So first thing I'll do is, I think this is something I already mentioned, and you might have encountered it in DL, but we often consolidate the whole left-hand side of this equation into something just called total head. And that's basically our energy density budget. It can change forms, right? It can be pressure. We can spend some on potential energy density, spend some on kinetic. But all those things just go back and forth in between each other. And that total is conserved unless we add energy density from a pump or dissipate some energy density with resistance. And the only other change I made on the right-hand side is that I added this sigma, which just means the sum of all these. So we could have multiple pumps and multiple segments of pipe with resistance, and we just add them together as we encounter them uh, in a section of a segment, in a section of a circuit. So no real conceptual change here, just a consolidation. Um, so the reason we do this, and a very helpful thing that comes out of it, is that when we have a full fluid circuit, so we've, so far we've just mostly looked at little segments. But when we have fluid that flows all the way around and back to where we started, we can just use our delta, our final and initial, as the same point. So in this case, let's say we take the top left corner of this circuit. I can flow all the way around the circuit and get right back to where I started, make that point my final and my initial. And then, no matter what happens in the circuit, the left-hand side of the equation, my change in total head, is 0. Right, because each of those final minus initial terms is going to be some value minus its value at the same spot. And so it just goes away. And what we're left with using this loop rule, loop rule just means when you go around a complete loop, the total head, the change in total head sums to zero. The result is that we just get that the sum of the energy densities added from pumps and dissipated from resistances has to equal zero. So in this simple circuit here where we just have one pump and one resistance, we get 0 equals E pump minus volume. right? So we get this nice relationship where the pump is adding energy density and the resistance is taking energy density away. And it lets us solve for the current if we want. Like let's say we know the energy density of the pump. We know the resistance that the pipe has. That will tell us what current is going to result. And there's only one answer that will work. Because in order for this circuit to be physically like, make sense, you can't have more than one answer for energy density at any given point. Right? So this loop rule has to be true. If I gain however many joules per meter cubed going through the pump, I have to lose that amount through the resistance as I flow through the circuit before I get back to my starting point. I have to get back to zero. Otherwise, I could go around the pump multiple times and gain an infinite amount of energy or lose or something like that, um, which is not possible. So the loop rule is very helpful. Um, so like I said, this is the most basic loop we could look at, just one pump and one value of resistance. And this kind of hints at how resistance can be more like discrete. What if we have two sections of pipe, each with a different resistance? The rest of the pipe doesn't have any. We'll just say most of the pipe is resistanceless. Just here we have R1, and here we have R2. So let's see what we can do here. Let's use our loop rule. Basically, just it's Bernoulli's equation, but the left-hand side cancels out because we're going around and starting and ending at the same point. So 0 on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we just have to sum through all the resistance and currents, or resistance and uh, batteries or pumps 
that, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, that we encounter. So as I said, let's say we start at point four, although it doesn't matter where we start. I go through the pump and I get an E pump over volume. Then I come down here, no resistance, no resistance. Then I reach R1. So I get a minus I times R1. And then I go through R2. So I get a minus I times R2. Uh, very important to notice that these are the same value of current, right? The I, I don't have I1 and I2. And that's because all of the current has to flow through both of these resistors, right? Any current that goes through the pump has to go through R1. Any Resist any current that goes through R1 also has to go through R2. So there's only one value of I here. Now I can do a little work, factor out the I, which is just maybe a convenient way to look at it, where this equation looks just like one where if I had a single resistance that had the resistance R1 plus R2, right? Single current flowing through one resistor that has a value of R1 plus R2. And that's actually a technique that we're going to use a lot, is finding like the equivalent resistance. So let's say I wanted to just replace these two resistances, which are in series. That just means one after another. All of the current has to flow through both. If I want to replace both resistors in series with a single resistor that has the same, the equivalent resistance, I just add them together. So the same total current would result if I had either R1 and R2 arranged in series like this, one after another, or if I had a single pipe with resistance R1 plus R2. I could also have R2 and then R1. The order doesn't matter, right? Addition is communicative, whatever. But R1 plus R2 is equal to R2 plus R1. Um, and again, very important to recognize that when resistances are in series, one after another, they have the same current. That's going to be a very helpful problem solving uh, tool. OK, so series is one way to arrange resistors, one after another. But we can also have them arranged in parallel or with a junction where the current can go to either or and then come back together. So how do we deal with this? Well, let's use the loop rule. We still have that, right? If I start at one point, trace it through the circuit and come back to that point. I still have to obey conservation, and I can have only one answer for energy density at that point. But I have two loops. So if we start at point three, I go through the pump, I get an E pump, and then I travel through the circuit, no resistance, then I reach this junction. Let's say I pick the top branch. So I go I1, R1, go through there, and then come back out no more resistance, and then I go back to point three. So my loop rule is just E pump over volume minus I1, R1. I could do the same thing for the bottom resistance. I could make a loop that goes through the pump, goes through R2, never touches R1, and goes back to the start. And both of these are completely valid. If you imagine you're like one water molecule traveling through this, right? It doesn't, it's, it's not going to see both of these branches. Each individual water molecule, or each cubic centimeter of water, whatever, is going to go around, choose one branch, and go through the top. And that's all it will know. So both of these are valid. Another way to view this, or something that comes out of it, is that the pressure change between 1 and 2 is the same, no matter which way I go. Right? So if I just zoom in, now instead of looking at the whole loop, just look at delta P from 1 to 2. Right? I know delta P going through the top branch. If we assume this is looking at it like, top down, right? so don't worry about potential energy density here. If I'm looking at it top down, going from 1 to 2, I just get delta P is minus I1 R1. Same thing, going through R2, I get minus I2 R2. That's just how energy density dissipation works in resistances. However, the important thing to note also here is that 1 and 2 are the same points, no matter it goes from 1 to 2 through R2 or 1 to 2 through R1. In other words, both of those changes are delta P, 1, 2. And I only have a single value for pressure at point 1 and a single value for pressure at point 2. So no matter which way I get from point 1 to point 2, I better have the same change in pressure. Does that make sense, right? Like if, let's say 1 is at 10 pascals. And if I go through the bottom branch, I lose 2 pascals. That would give me an answer of 8 pascals at point 2. But then, what if 
R1 gave me a pressure change of minus one Pascal. That would tell me that the pressure at two is nine Pascals. So if I go this way, it's eight, and if I go that way, it's nine. And that's not possible, because this is a single point, and there can only be one pressure there. So when resistances are arranged in parallel like this, just meaning that you can go to either one or the other, or the other, or the other, then they have to share a pressure change going across, yeah. Why it's negative here? Well, this is just Bernoulli's equation. So the, yeah, the delta P and delta KE and pump we canceled out. Um, yeah, good question. Okay, so that allows us to equate the two, like I1, R1 equals I2, R2, right? Since we know that the pressure changes have to be equal, yeah. Like if I add in another one hooked up the same way? Right, got rid of R2. Yep, then yeah, that would be series. Yeah, that would be just like before. So if I got, yeah, if I had R, no R2, R1 here, and then R3 later on, like between points two and three, then it would just be R1 plus R3. Um, okay. So what we've learned is that the pressure change across this branch and this branch, the top branch and the bottom, are the same, right? However, the currents now are not necessarily the same. In fact, they can't be. They follow a different relationship, which is that the currents in each of the branches have to sum to the total, right? So this is kind of an addition to our conservation of current rule. We still have, I mean, it's like a physical law, right? If I have a certain amount of fluid, I can't create or destroy it. So if I have five molecules of water flowing through point one every second, and two go to, go to the bottom branch, then the remaining three have to go to the top. And then when they come back and meet at point two, they'll add back up to five. And so my total current stays the same anywhere where there's the total current. And when I'm in the branches, all of them add together to equal my total. In other words, I1 plus I2 equals I, which is the total current that goes through the pump. So I1 and I2 don't have to be equal. In fact, they won't be. They'll follow this expression here. If R2 is bigger, then I2 will have to be smaller, which we'll, we'll cover that in more detail. But anyway, these are the key relationships we figured out for resistances in parallel, or one, uh, parallel meaning that you can go either or. So the goal is to replace these resistances with a single resistance that will behave the same way. And by behave the same way, I mean that we'll have the same pressure change, right? So no matter what, we're going from point one to point two, just put a black box over the center and just replace it with a single resistance instead of whatever combination you have in whatever shape. And I want that single resistance to give me the same pressure change if all of the current flows through it called finding the equivalent resistance. So in this case, what I want to do, when I had the two branches, I had minus I1, R1 equals minus I2, R2, and I want to say that's also just equal to minus I, the total current, times whatever this R parallel is, whatever the equivalent resistance is. We found for a series, when they're just one after another, to get this equivalent value, you just add them. But it's a little more complicated when they're in parallel, I'm not going to walk through all the algebra. I'll put it up on the screen and then you can look at it later, but it's all coming from just this information that we already figured out. The fact that they share a voltage drop, or I keep saying voltage, they share a pressure drop between one and two, right? The energy density change between one and two has to be the same no matter which branch I take, and the fact that current is conserved, this junction rule, that the current in each branch adds up to our total, and if we just rearrange and substitute whatever, but using no more information than that, I can find this expression here, that the equivalent resistance follows this R parallel, follows this equation, which is very similar in some ways to the series, except now everything is its inverse. So one over the equivalent resistance, R parallel, is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2. Um, 
So again, they share a pressure change, and they would also, that would be the same pressure change as if I replaced these two resistances with a single pipe that has resistance R parallel and all the current flowed through it. I would get the same total current coming through the pump, and I would get the same pressure change across it. And we'll see that in practice. Um, but first, now that we've figured out these laws, let's just switch to electrical circuits. So we're gonna find every, pretty much everything that applied for fluid circuits is going to work the exact same way for electrical circuits. I'll walk us through piece by piece, but if we just take a look at this and squint, we can see that they, they're really the same components here, and the equations look extremely similar. Um, so let's just look at some details before we go back to applying these laws. First of all, current. We still have current, right, except before, when we had volume per time, the amount of fluid flowing through the circuit, we don't measure electricity by volume, we measure it by uh, charge, right? So our, we swap out meters cubed with coulombs, which is just the base unit for the amount of charge, so we have coulombs per second, which is also equal to an amp, which you might have heard before, but amps are the flow of current. That's our new flow rate. Um, we know that in real life, you've learned this in other science classes, like electrons are the thing that flow, right? You have a bunch of atoms with nuclei and the electrons get passed along the wire in between them. However, for some reason in physics, we consider current to be the flow of positive charge. In no world is there are there protons floating down a wire moving through. They're a lot heavier than electrons and that doesn't happen, but we don't really care about that and it actually makes our life a little easier because considering current to be the flow of positive charge means that current just flows from positive to negative in a battery. So here's our battery. I'll talk about these in a sec, but positive node of the battery, current will flow out of there around the circuit to the negative. So that's just something to note. We'll, when we talk about current, we mean the flow of positive charge, uh, but if you catch yourself out on the streets being questioned about how electrical circuits work, you know that electrons are the thing that are moving. Okay, so that's our current. Just swap out volume for uh, charge, and we're gonna do the same thing for our energy density, voltage. So I might have accidentally said it before, um, but now, just instead of doing joules, energy per meters cubed, joules per volume, we just do joules per charge. We wanna know how much each one of these charges that's flowing through our circuit, how much energy it has. And a joules per coulomb is a volt. That's the unit for voltage. And so if you'll see, the left-hand side of this equation, where normally we have change in pressure, change in potential energy density, change in kinetic energy density, all these different energy density systems, now we only have voltage. Because elect like, electricity doesn't care how high above Earth's surface it is or how fast it's moving. Um, it just simplifies. It's like voltage, now we only have to deal with like pressure and ignore the other stuff. So that the left-hand side of this equation is simpler. Um, the only other remaining part of the left-hand side here, we talked about what V is, is the delta. And the delta works the same way as it did with fluid circuits where you pick a start point, pick an end point, final voltage minus initial voltage, and that tells you your voltage change or your change in energy density, right? So how much does the energy density of a charge change as it flows from my initial to my final? And that's the left-hand side of this equation. Um, or, yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. So a lot simpler than Bernoulli's equation. Now we have the right-hand side, which is even more similar um, than the left-hand side, I think, to Bernoulli's. If you look, we still have the sum of all the pumps and resistances, except now, instead of a pump, we have a battery. So just like a pump has a certain energy density, just E pump over volume, a battery has a certain energy density, a certain voltage associated with it, right? You've heard one and a half volt battery, three volt battery, whatever. That's just telling us if I send a charge through that battery from negative to positive, how much energy density, how much voltage does it gain, right? And we often call that epsilon um, or EMF, you might hear. They're just different words that mean the voltage of the battery. And so we sum up all the batteries that we have in a system, and then, so those are the things that are adding energy density, and then the things that are taking away are resistors. So resistors are these squiggly line things here. Um, light bulbs are also resistors, so you'll see light bulbs drawn. Resistors turn 
electrical energy density into heat. Um, light bulbs, of course, turn it into light and maybe also some heat. But either way, they have a resistance, current flows through them, and as a result, we get a decrease in energy density as we go from one side to the other. If the units of resistance are ohms, um, it's uh, just like fluid resistance, it's kind of an ugly unit if you break it down, but it works out so that I times R, I here meaning electrical current, um, gives you volts as we would want for this equation to work out. Uh, so yeah, that, that's really it. That's all we have for to change our fluid circuit into an electrical circuit. So let's try this out real quick. Let's do the loop rule um, on a very simple circuit that just has one battery and one resistance, which we did for fluids. So starting at point four, uh, first we go through the battery. So if we just zoom in on that piece, the voltage change here going from four to one is final minus initial V1 minus V4 is just epsilon, the voltage of the battery. So flowing from positive to negative through the battery, or sorry, negative to positive through the battery, we get an increase in voltage. And now we know current flows from positive to negative through the circuit. So and that's kind of, there's kind of two ways that happens. Through the circuit, current flows from positive to negative. Within the battery, current flows from negative to positive. It like kind of pumps it up. The battery is there to like kind of artificially increase the voltage. But then once the current is outside the battery, it just wants to flow naturally to where the voltage is lower. Okay, because this side is pushing harder than that side is a way to think about it. Okay, so we get epsilon from the battery, nothing between point one and two, there's no resistance, no nothing. Then going from two to three, I get a delta V of V3 minus V2 of minus IR, right? That comes into our loop rule up there. And then going from three back to four, I get nothing. And so putting those all together into my delta V loop, that's just V4 minus V4, which is of course zero, equals the sum of all of the batteries and resistances. So we just get zero equals epsilon minus IR, which looks very much like the delta P, uh, or zero equals delta P minus IR, or delta P equals minus IR that we saw before. Uh, but that lets us solve for the current, right? So if I hook up a battery to a resistor, the current is going to be one specific value, and that's the one that satisfies this loop rule that gives us exactly the same voltage drop across the resistor as we gain from the battery, right? So that's one thing our loop rule shows here. If the battery is a three volt battery, right? I start at, I'm a charge, I start at point four, I go through the battery, and now I'm at point one, and now I have three volts. The battery gave me three volts. I flow down from one to two, nothing. Two to three, I get some voltage drop, minus IR, and then I'm back at four. And I have to be back at zero. So if I had three volts, and the only place I could lose any energy density was through the resistor, then the resistor had to make me lose minus three volts. And that also just comes out in the loop rule, that epsilon equals IR. Uh, magnitude wise. Okay, let's do a clicker question. So looking at the same circuit, what happens to the current I if epsilon, the voltage of the battery is doubled? So take a three volt battery, make it six volts, what happens to the current? Give you 15 more seconds. All right, well, we have the same work we just did. Our loop rule is just zero equals epsilon minus IR. And so we can solve for the current in terms of epsilon and R. And if I double epsilon, double the voltage of the battery, I also will double my current. Yeah. Uh, it's joules, or sorry, flow is coulombs per second. So instead of volume of fluid, meters cubed per second, it's charge per second, which is coulombs. Yeah, exactly, it's amps. Um, okay, another clicker question. What will happen to the current if R, the resistance, is doubled? 
take a three ohm resistor, make it six ohms, what happens to the current then? Okay. Well, same equation again, except now we're doubling R. And so if we double R, we will half the current. And so what we're finding is, I think, a pretty intuitive relationship. You take a battery, and you hook it up to a resistance, and you get some current. Right? We decided that current is whatever will make, will satisfy the loop rule. But then if we double the power, or double the voltage of the battery, then it can send more current through. Like the, the resistor doesn't seem as bad, if you want to think to the battery. The resistor, so it can send more current. Another way to think of it is it has to send more current because now it has to get the same voltage drop, right? So if I double epsilon from three volts to six volts, I also have to double the minus IR term in order to make this equal to zero. I'm not touching the resistance, right? The resistor stays the same. All I'm doing is doubling the, the battery. And so if I do that, I have to double the current in order to get this equation to work out. Same thing with if we double the value of the resistor. Now I'm increasing the value of the resistor, but not touching the battery. And so if the resistor gets stronger, the battery is like, whoa, this, this is a lot stronger of a resistor and can't send as much current through. Another way to think of it is it, it well, it's still, it can't send as much current through, but be, to satisfy the loop rule. Because if we increase R, I has to go down because we're not changing the power of the battery. So whether you want to think of it more as this like power struggle between battery and resistor or just work better doing the algebra out, um, either one. And in fact, I think you should be able to do both. Uh, it will come in handy. Okay, so consider all that a detour. It was just kind of trying on a new skin for this model, which is instead of fluids, now we're talking about electricity, but it works very similarly. Let's just take those rules we devised from when we have resistances in series or in parallel, let's just move them over and make them true for electricity too, which it turns out they are. The same exact equations I wrote out, except swap out your delta P for delta Vs, and you get the same thing. So on the left, we have series, resistancer, resistors, resistancers. Resistors is just R1 and R2, one after the other. And so you can almost, it's base, it is a definition that resistors are in series if they share a current. All of the current goes through both of them. And that works both ways. If they are in series, then all the current goes through both of them to share a current. Uh, whichever way is more useful for you to think about it. And so if we want to replace them uh, with a single R equivalent, we just have to find out what that equivalent resistance will be that acts the same. In other words, gives the same total current or feels the same to the battery, right? So the battery hooked up to either the R equivalent that we find or both R1 and R2 in series, one after another, uh, will be the same. Similarly for parallel resistors or ones where the current can go to either or, but they share a voltage change, we can replace them with a different R equivalent. There's a different equation for that but we could equally place a single resistor there that now receives all of the current and acts the same. In other words, produces the same I total and feels the same to the battery. And those equations are just what we found before. If we have resistors in series, we just add them together. So R1 plus R2. And if I added another one on the end, it would be plus R3. And that can keep going and going and going. Again, they share current. However, they don't have to share a voltage drop. As we'll see, the voltage drop can be whatever, right? Each one of these is minus IR1 and minus IR2. So if R1 is bigger, minus IR1 is going to be bigger than minus IR2. The only thing that will stay the same is that the sum of the voltage drops has to satisfy the loop rule. So get us back to zero from whatever voltage we gained from the battery. And then for parallel resistors, we have this equation where it looks like the other one except everything's inverted. And we find uh, that they don't share a current, but that the currents in each of the parallel resistors add up to the total current. And this also generalizes to more and more. So if I add in another R3 in parallel with these two, like start to make it look like a ladder, add a bunch of them, 
My total current would just be I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4, whatever. All of those have to add up because they're coming from I total. And so when they come back together, they'll turn back into I total. And my REQ equation will just gain a plus 1 over R3, plus 1 over R4, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try this out. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you, I'll, uh, before I answer that, let's, let's try it out and then we'll, we'll do it together when we solve it. So the click through question is I have two 3 ohm resistors in parallel at, or in series. So is it true that two 3 ohm resistors in parallel will have a greater resist, equivalent resistance than the same two resistors in series? So give that a shot. Give you 15 more seconds. Okay, I'll stop us there. You did a nice job on this one. So the top equation was the one for a series, the bottom was for parallel. So if we first try a series, that one's easier. Two 3 ohm resistors just add, and we get the equivalent resistance of 6 ohms. So if we have one battery hooked up to two 3 ohm resistors in parallel or in series, that would function the exact same as a single 6 ohm resistor. Then parallel, we plug these in, and so we get 1 over REQ equals 1 over 3 ohms plus 1 over 3 ohms, which equals 2 over 3 inverse ohms. So here's a case where it's very useful to keep units in because very often students will submit an answer or write one down that's just this, two-thirds. But you're not quite done yet because two-thirds inverse ohms is equal to one over REQ. And keeping the ohms here with the negative one reminds you that, oh, my units are wacky. I still need to do something else, and that's flip it. So to solve for REQ, I need to do one over that, which gives us three halves of an ohm. So the equivalent resistance of two 3 ohm resistors in parallel is actually 3 over 2 ohms. So we actually decreased the equivalent resistance by putting them in parallel. And that's actually always going to be true, even more generally. Anytime you have a bunch of resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance, so the resulting resistance, is going to be less than the smallest resistor that you have hooked up. So let's think of it like people passing through a hallway. So it's not exactly how electric resistance works, but let's say you have a single hallway and you have to get, like this whole class has to leave through the hallway. We're gonna have, there's gonna be some resistance, right? It's gonna, people are gonna bump into each other, whatever, and we're gonna slow down because we all have to get through. That's our single resistor with current passing through it. But now I open up another side exit. Right? And all, so that's opening up another pathway, another resistor. It still has resistance because that other side exit still has a finite width. It still can only allow a certain amount of people through, but it will lighten the load on that main exit a little bit. Right? And so the overall, it will be easier for us to get out. The overall resistance will go down. Even if that side exit is only one person standing this way, only that wide, even if it's only going to let out three people total in the time it takes us to all leave, it will still lessen the load a little bit and, less, and thus lessen the overall equivalent resistance. So why is it smaller than even the smallest resistance? We'll flip that around. Let's say you're, you only have one exit. Or maybe let, let's forget the exit analogy. Let's just talk about the resistor. Let's say you have a one ohm resistor. All of the current is going to flow through that one ohm resistor. Great. Now I hook up in parallel to it a thousand ohm resistor. It's going to be very hard for the electricity to go through the thousand ohm resistor, right? And that we haven't really proved that yet, but you kind of you probably have a notion that like electricity or current wants to follow the path of least resistance, right? That's a, like a colloquial term a lot of us know, and it's true. 
more of the current will want to go through the one ohm resistor. However, some of it will want to go through the thousand ohm resistor. Not much, just like with us, most of us will go through the wider entrance, some of it will go through the thousand ohm resistor. And so that setup is a little bit easier for the current to get through than just the single one ohm resistor. Because now it's the one ohm resistor, except there's a little extra pathway, where even if only a few charges go through it, it's still a little easier. So maybe that helps. If not, the algebra will always show it. But it's a good way to check your answer. If you're solving for the equivalent resistance of resistors in parallel, your answer is going to be smaller than the smallest resistor you have. It won't always be neat like one half what your original was, but um, when you do have resistors that have the same value put in parallel, you get somewhat neater expressions. Anyway, the answer here is false. Um, hooking them up in parallel uh, produces a lower equivalent resistance than hooking them up in series. So higher current you would get. Um, okay, so this is something we'll explore a lot. And next lecture, I will do a lot more rigorous of an example, taking a much more complicated circuit. Like these are the most simple things we could have, just two resistors in parallel or series. But you can, of course, have much more complexity. So I'll do that in detail and find current at different points in a circuit and see the, all the peculiars that happen there. Um, but first, I'll give you a chance to do that in DL. So this week in DL, you'll see some more um, complicated examples and try it out for yourself. But there is more instruction on that coming. Um, the last concept I want to introduce in lecture, however, is power. So we've talked about the flow of charge, right? Charge per second moving through the circuit. And we've also talked about how much energy each one of those charges has, its energy density, right? Char energy per charge. And so if we multiply those two things together, current and voltage, flow rate and energy density, charge cancels out, and we just get energy per time. So now power, which, which by definition is power. So by multi multiplying together charge per unit time and energy per charge, we can track the amount of energy per unit time that's flowing through the circuit, either being introduced, like pumped in by the battery, power source, or being dissipated by a light bulb. Right, if you think about, or a resistor. When you think about a light bulb working, it's giving off light, right? That's thermal energy that it's being dissipated into the environment, and that's energy that's being dissipated per second, so there's some power. Power is measured in watts, right? And that's why light bulbs that you buy at the store are often labeled in, in their wattage, how much power they dissipate. Um, but you'll explore that in, in DL, I think for an FNT as well. But anyway, Power by definition is voltage times current. Um, batteries give energy to charges, so they provide power to the circuit. And as a result, or not as a result, but separately, resistors and light bulbs, um, which are really the same thing, those dissipate power. They take it out. And just like conservation of energy density, we have the conservation of power, where whatever energy density a battery pumps into a circuit will be dissipated equally and oppositely by the resistors, right? So if the battery is pumping in two watts, the, resist the resistors all together will dissipate two watts. So we don't just have this buildup of energy nowhere, or, di or like disappearance of energy over time. Um, so to apply these to the specific values we have, for batteries it's very simple, current is I, voltage is just the voltage change across the battery, which is just a given, it's a characteristic of the battery, epsilon. So the power provided by the battery is I times epsilon. And for a resistor, the, I mean, it's also simple. It's just I times the voltage change across a resistor. Here we'll use the absolute value. Um, just because it's easier, it's easier to say that the dissipation of power in a resistor is four watts or whatever, rather than get into like, oh, the power is negative four watts. Uh, it just gets very awkward. So it's easier to just, every power is positive, and we either talk about it being provided or dissipated. So I times delta B, except we can break this down more, right? Because we know the delta B across a resistor is minus IR. So I times absolute value of delta B is just I squared times R. So the current going through a resistor times the resistance of that resistor, or current squared times the resistance of that resistor. Um, we can also solve it differently. We know that the current flowing through a resistor is equal to the voltage change across it divided by R. So it could also be equal to delta V squared 
over r, all three of these expressions are exactly the same thing. You just have, there's three values here, i, delta d, and r, and you want to use whichever of these is most convenient. So if I know the voltage drop and the resistance, I'll use this one. If I know the current and the resistance, I'll use this one. But you can never go wrong. Let's say I really only know, I mean, they'll be given to you on equation sheets and on quizzes, so you'll, you'll have them. But let's say I only know this one, and I only know how to do it with i and delta d, but I know i and r, well, I can just solve for delta d by multiplying i times r, and then using it here. It's the same thing as this one. So I'm just trying to emphasize, there's no correct expression here. These are all completely equivalent, and they'll give you the same results. It's just sometimes one's a little less work than the others, depending on what values you have. So let's do an example with this. On the right, or sorry, on the left, we just have a battery hooked up to a single light bulb. So this is a symbol for a light bulb, but it works just like a resistor, has some resistance R. So we do our loop rule, going around, total voltage drop is zero, and so we just, that's equal to the voltage provided by the battery minus the voltage drop across the resistor, so epsilon minus IR. So our current is epsilon over R, and we can solve for our power dissipated in the light bulb, I squared times R, since we have both of those things, is epsilon squared over R. So that by itself is not super informative, but it tells us, it gives us like a reference that a battery with voltage epsilon hooked up to one res light bulb with resistance R will give us a power dissipation in the light bulb of epsilon squared over R. It also means that the voltage, or sorry, the power provided by the battery is equal to epsilon squared over R, right? That's the power provided by the battery and thus has to be the power dissipated by the light bulb. Um, if we wanted to solve for the power dissipation of the battery, we would just, I mean, it would be the same exact thing. Remember, it's epsilon times I, so here's our current, which goes through both the resistor and the battery, so current times epsilon is the exact same thing. So that's just a little check. Now let's compare that to the power dissipation in a circuit where we have a battery and two light bulbs in parallel. So I total is epsilon over REQ, which we don't have yet, but this is the goal, right? We want to simplify these into a single resistance that behaves the same way, produces the same I total. And so this is our goal. And to find that, we have an equation. We just do one over REQ is the sum of the inverses of the resistances, both of these are R, and so if we solve that for REQ, we find that REQ is R over two, which makes sense, right? This equivalent resistance is smaller than either of the two resistances themselves, so check, that's correct. And now we can solve for our total current using our initial expression that uh, epsilon over REQ is two epsilon over R, okay? And now finally, we can solve for the power dissipation in this whole circuit. Um, so now we've simplified it down to a single resistance that has resistance R over two. And so I is this, R is that. And so I squared times R is equal to two epsilon squared over R. So what we found is the total power dissipation in this circuit is twice the total power dissipation in the circuit on the left when we hooked up another light bulb. So that's kind of interesting. Um, let's do an experiment, or kind of like test this out physically. 